Okay, we are recording. Um, this is a short little segment to go over uh, uh, one uh, potential topic. I'm expecting there to be at least one or two questions on the NABSEP test uh, surrounding uh, not necessarily the Bakersfield fire, but rather the cause of the Bakersfield fire. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, and that is uh, improper installation of uh, expansion fittings um, for conduit. Okay, uh, so we're going to scroll through this. This is like the most significant um, uh, event in PV, you know, negative press that we've we've had uh, thus far. Um, so uh, going through here, this is a great report. Seven pages long. Bill Brooks, and uh, he summarizes the uh, right here. Two corrective items are required. Okay, so um, one of the things that might have uh, uh, prevented this from happening is if a, a high voltage insulation uh, uh, testing was done um, on all the PV array conductors. Okay. Um, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a, using a mega uh, to make sure that there wasn't any uh, uh, compromise in the inflation. Had they done that, they might have discovered that the uh, grounded PV conductor was, uh, had a fault in it. Okay? <clears throat> and then number two, use of expansion joints and long conduit, conduit runs while ensuring that they're properly installed. And that's the crux of the matter here, and that's where I want uh, to kind of show you guys uh, where in the NEC, we need to go to uh, 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 determine the expansion coefficients of temperature for various types of conduit, okay? Because you may get a question like that on the test. Uh, but, okay, so, so what happened with this, uh, this fire is, uh, you can see right here, the, the, the first event, was the fact that the grounded current carrying conductor, the PV negative, had a fault, okay? But uh, that was undetected uh, because the, uh, the PV negative is already grounded. Um, uh, fault detection in a PV system, um, uh, typically for a grounded PV system, is, is, um, is on the PV positive side. If there's a fault on the PV positive side, that will uh, cause the GFDI fuse to be blown, okay? But if the PV negative side, the grounded conductor, already has a fault in it, um, it will bypass the, uh, the, the fuse and, uh, and never blow that fuse, so that detection cannot occur. So because there was a fault in the PV grounded side, um, that caused a very dangerous situation whereby when a second fault occurred on the PV positive, that is the, ungra the ungrounded conductor, let me show you here, this article, okay? <clears throat> right here, when there was another fault on this side, that allowed the circular currents to, to uh, occur uninhibited um, causing causing this fault to ground, and it actually pulled back the currents of all the other strings, 76 amps from this string, 84 amps from this string, plus the 152 amps from this string, all being pulled back and allowed these circular currents to continue uh, uh, uninhibited um, and, and allow this fire situation to occur, okay? Um, So, what caused the problem? Okay, so this is figure two explanation. Thermal expansion in a long conduit run housing PV output circuit conductors caused an expansion joint to fail and damage a large 500 uh, uh, MC mills uh, ungrounded output cable. Resulting high magnitude ground fault currents quickly clear the ground fault fuse in the inverter. Um, after the ground connection is lifted at the inverter, the available ground currents return through the fault in the ground, grounded source circuit conductor through the array bonding hardware 
and the metal conduit parts to the fault to be ungrounded out the conductor. Because the grounded conductor is unfused, uh, these high magnitude fault currents continue without interruption. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I take that back. The, uh, the ground fault fuse uh, did clear, but because there was a, a fault within the uh, grounded conductor, that allowed those circular currents to, to continue, okay? Um, so, at any rate, the, the cause of the problem was, was here, okay? The failure of an improperly specified and installed expansion joint likely triggered the Bakersfield fire. However, had this been the first fault in the system, the GFP device uh, would have been able to detect and interrupt the fault before any damage was done. But because there was already a fault on the grounded conductor, um, uh, it, the, the, uh, the ground fault was allowed to continue. So what does that mean to you? Okay. All right. So um, in reviewing... Pull up. Okay, so within the NEC, the uh, here's here's an example, uh, an article three three fifty two. Okay, this one applies specifically to PVC conduit. Okay, if you were to get a question that was to ask, um, uh, you know, how many expansion fittings do you need um, for a conductor run? on a rooftop that has uh, a 100 degree Fahrenheit variation uh, um, for a, uh, a conductor run that was, you know, 100 feet long. Uh, how many expansion joint fittings would you need, uh, assuming the expansion joints that you're using will accommodate a four inch, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it called here? Hold on, let me pull this back. Uh, for its travel length, okay? <laughs> so, let me pull this up. All right. Let me get back to the proper. There we go. Okay, so that's a lot of information <laughs> to try to absorb, but. Uh, the, the answer you would find uh, by going to the article that defines the uh, expansion coefficients for various types of, of conduit. In this case, Article 352 covers PVC, rigid polyvinyl fluoride conduit. Okay, and there's there's lots of information here. Um, in fact, let me let me start at the beginning of this uh, of this article. Okay, so let's go back. Right. Okay. Article 352, rigid polyvinyl chloride conduit, PVC. Okay. It gives its definition, <clears throat> uh, tells you where it can be used in, how it needs to be listed, uh, corrosive influences, tells you that it can be used in wet locations uh, under specific uh, sets of circumstances. And that is that the, uh, the supports, the bolts, the straps, and so forth shall be corrosion resistant and protected against corrosion. It can be used in dry and damp locations. It can be exposed. It can be used for underground installations. Okay. Uh, support of conduit bodies uh, are um, uh, uh, dictated by another article. Um, uh, tells you where it cannot be used. Okay. So the reason why I'm bringing all this stuff up is. Uh, uh, you know, there may be other questions surrounding the use of PVC. Now you know where to find those answers. Um, indicates the ambient temperatures. Uh, cannot be subject to ambient temperatures in excess of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and cannot be used uh, for less than trade size uh, one half inch. Okay. Um, going up here. Uh, can't be used. Uh, larger than trade size 6, okay? Um, indicate some information about conduit fill. How many bins you can have uh, in one run, not more than four. Uh, how the trimming needs to be done, okay? All cut 
ends shall be trimmed inside and outside to remove rough edges. Okay. Um, securing and supporting shall be installed in complete system as provided by 300.18 um, and uh, shall be fastened so that movement from thermal expansion or contraction is permitted. PVC conduit shall be securely fastened and supported in, in accordance with uh, 352.30 uh, A and B. Um, okay, so here's 30A. PVC conduit shall be securely fastened within three feet of each outlet box. All right, that's something you may need to know specifically about PVC conduit. Okay, and then PVC uh, conduit shall be supported as required in table 352.30. Um, conduit listed for support and spacing shall be uh, shown, should be permitted to be installed in accordance with the listing. Horizontal runs uh, are supported by openings to framing members at intervals not to exceed those in this table. Okay. Um, some information on unsupported raceways. And table 352.30. Support. So if you're using a trade size, one half to one inch, then you have to have supports uh, at every three feet or less. If you're using trade size, one and a quarter uh, to two to two, then you need um, uh, uh, five feet or less, and so on. Okay. Expansion fittings, and this is where it gets into the uh, the, the crux of this issue. Expansion fittings for PVC conduit shall be provided to compensate for thermal expansion and contraction where the length change in accordance with Table 352.44 is expected to be more, to be six millimeters, and that is one quarter inch or greater in a straight run between securely mounted items such as boxes, cabinets, elbows, or other conduit terminations. Okay? And then it talks a little bit about bushings here. Um, and so, here is the table, 352.44, one of the tables that you might need to get familiar with, okay? So if you, if the question is calling for a temperature range of, uh, say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit for PVC, you can expect the length of change in the PVC conduit to be 4.06 inches, okay? So you would need to have an expansion fitting that was uh, greater than 4.06 inches, or you might choose to put two expansion fittings in the, uh, in, in the, um, in the run, okay? And, uh, so all of this is very confusing, and I wanted to uh, uh, point out that there are uh, there's this great document from Carlon that 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 provides a great explanation, code references, and I'm going to post this up uh, uh, with this video on the website so people can download this explanation. It shows you um, what an expansion fitting looks like talks about code references, um, talks about the, uh, the, uh, the, the thermal coefficients involved, and, and gives you installation instructions. Now here's the key, and this is where I think uh, uh, NAPSAP might try to uh, um, ask you a question about this. Proper installation of expansion fittings uh, includes not, not only knowing how much travel uh, uh, that you need, but also uh, to install one properly, it's, it's the function of uh, the installation is a function of whatever the current ambient temperature is at the time that you're installing it. And there's a great illustration here. Okay, I'm going to slide this up to this point. Okay, setting expansion fitting for temperature. Okay, <clears throat> so if you have one of these uh, Carlon expansion fittings, um, and if the ambient temperature outside is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you would install this thing such that it was uh, halfway in the barrel, as indicated by this, this diagram here, okay? Um, if it was extremely hot temperature, that PVC is expanded out to its maximum point. So you would want it to be set at the three-quarter 
uh, uh, dial. If it was a cold temperature, you would want it set at one quarter. So, you know, the installation of these devices is really a function of the external temperature at the time that you're installing them. Um, if you did this wrong and you, say, were to, uh, um, say, for instance, if you were to install, if it was a hot day, if you were to install uh, the, uh, the, the, the coupling, the expansion fitting at, say, at one quarter in, then as the temperature gets colder and those, the conduit shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, well, then you're in a situation where that sleeve can actually fall out and cause that, that uh, abrasion on the conductors uh, uh, akin to what we see with the Bakersfield fire. Um, so, so it's really important when you do these installations that uh, you're taking into account the external ambient temperature. Okay, um, so I'm going to provide this document on the website uh, for you guys to read through. It actually takes you through a couple of different examples, step by step, and how to calculate and uh, uh, you know how uh, how many fittings that that you would need uh, based on the run. Um, and I think if you kind of wrap your head around this concept, oh, uh, here's another uh, um, thing to consider is that uh, when you're doing these installations, the, uh, let me find the diagram that shows this, okay, this is not it, uh, moment please, okay, all right, okay, here we go, proper position. Okay, so you see the barrel side, the external side, is actually anchored to the barrel. It's fixed, okay, but for the rest of the conduit, the pipe strap is mounted loosely. So you want that, that uh, uh, essentially the male side of the, uh, uh, the conduit uh, to uh, be able to move freely. So the kind of strapping that you do on that conduit must allow for that, that, that motion, that expansion and contraction. But the barrel side, you know, the female side of the connection is fixed and locked down, okay? So this is a great illustration of what that looks like. Um, and I believe there's another one further down. Here we go. Ah, okay. So um, if you're just using one expansion fitting between two fixed objects, then you would actually fix the the female side, you lock down the barrel side, but allow the, the conduit to run through the port fittings that are loose to allow for that expansion and contraction, okay? And then here's a great diagram that shows two expansion fittings, um, and you would lock down the, uh, uh, the, the barrels, make them fixed and rigid, have them back to back, and then allow loose fittings for the supports to allow the, the, the conductors to the conduit to move back and forth, okay? Um, one note that they make, and I'll just point this out, and then I think we will have said everything we need to say about this. Let me see if I can find that. Okay. Expansion, contraction. Oh, okay, uh, for conduit installed outdoors. Now, I would hope that if you got a question on installation of expansion fittings, that they would provide this variable for you. But the note from the manufacturer is if you're installing this outdoors in full sunlight and that conduit's exposed to sunlight, then you need to add 30 degrees Fahrenheit to the ambient air temperature, okay? Very much like you would when designing for low voltage on a module. If you've got that, uh, uh, depending on the mounting method, you're going to add a certain amount of temperature to, to the uh, ambient temperature uh, uh, to, to, uh, because those, those modules sitting out in the sun are going to be um, uh, hotter than the surrounding air. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, another, I guess, analogy would be, you know, conduit exposed to sunlight on the temperature lowers the ampacity of the conductors, excuse me, conduit on the rooftop exposed to sunlight uh, uh, lowers the ampacity of the conductors because of the additional heat. 
very similar concept here that the thermal expansion is going to be affected by exposure to sunlight, and they're saying if it's exposed to sunlight, add 30 degrees Fahrenheit ambient. My hope is that if there's a question on the test, they'll, they'll let you know that this is exposed to sunlight and give you some hint that maybe you're supposed to add a little extra temperature to it. I don't know if they're going to go that far with it, but uh, be prepared for anything. Um, and that actually is not the point that I wanted to make here. Um, Richard? Yes. Does that also apply for a, a buried conduit underground? Um, there, okay, good question. It says, use of expansion fittings were concrete encased or direct buried, okay? Um, they, they, they said that you usually don't need it if it's buried underground um, or in concrete because um, uh, the expansion of the ground is going to move with the conduit, so it's, they're both moving, uh, except that, um, let's see, the only place where an expansion fitting would be utilized is where the concrete itself has an expansion joint. Sometimes they build into concrete expansion, so at that point there may be an expansion joint that's required. The other consideration is in cold areas. Buried lines must be below the frost line to prevent buckling during freezing and thawing cycles. Okay, so uh, yeah, so you, so you need to for the buried stuff it needs to be below the frost line. Okay, um, all right. And here it talks about the most common mistake. The most common error is not using enough expansion fittings. When in doubt, use an additional expansion fitting. Much more difficult and costly to insert an expansion fitting once the wiring has been set up and in service. Okay, and okay, and this was the point that I was trying to to find here, and that this guy right here, the wire inside conduit. The coefficient of expansion for the wire inside the conduit is much lower than the non-metallic conduit. Therefore, its length change due to the expansion and contraction is very little. The expansion fittings are mounted correctly. There should be little concern as to the effects of the wire inside. Okay, and this means that this about uh, 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 PVC, non-metallic conduit, which expands and contracts way more than metallic con conduit does. Um, so, that being said, let me uh, let me jump back to the NEC code, to the NEC, and note that this is. 352. This is specifically for PVC. The PVC is not the only type of, uh, of conduit out there. Know that there are other types of conduit. I'm going to try to start at the beginning here. Okay. All right. Okay. So here's this IMC. Okay. Uh, has its own requirements for supporting and securing. Doesn't seem to have a, a thermal coefficients associated with it, but rigid, rigid metal conduit. You know, maybe it's more likely that you're going to get a question about rigid metal conduit. And in the same way that there were all that there were these specific requirements for PVC in terms of the support and the expansion coefficients. And, uh, and various other um, uh, parameters. Same thing exists for rigid metal conduit. Okay, let me see if I can find that in here. Number of conductors, what location, securely fastened three feet from each body. All right, couplings, running threads. Marking standard length. All right. Huh. I'm not seeing the uh, expansion coefficient, but I, I believe they exist for RMC. Here's FMC. Okay, so flexible metal conduit. Uh, uh, all right, number of conductors that can be used. Liquid type. Flexible metal conduit. Okay. Okay. 
A, B, C, which we've already been through. So far, I'm not seeing the thermal coefficients for these other types. Um, it's been a while. So high density polyethylene conduit. Non-metallic underground conduit. Okay. RTRC. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it's been a while since I've looked at these articles. Um, uh, I guess not every conduit type has ex uh, thermal expansion characteristics that are posted uh, by temperature within the NEC. Uh, RTRC and PVC appear to be two that do. Um, but just note that there's a, a whatever conduit they're asking for, uh, note that in, this auto, uh, in chapter three, uh, uh, there's specific provisions that uh, surround each of these different types of conduit. And some of them have very detailed uh, uh, thermal coefficients. Um, I'm just going to see if this other one, EMT, okay, flexible metal, right. Okay, so that, that's the end of that. Um, just know that these different conduit types are there. Uh, if you get a question on, on utilizing expansion fittings for uh, uh, a conductor run, conduit run, um, this is where you'd go to, uh, to, to get those expansion coefficients. I will post the, um, the article from uh, Carlon that uh, defined uh, the proper installation and use with all the code references for PVC non-metallic conduit. And I think if you read this article and identify those places in the NEC code where these uh, conduit properties exist, that you shouldn't have any problem uh, on the test uh, for any uh, uh, expansion fitting question you get. So with that being said, uh, is there any, any question? Okay. <coughs> So I'll go ahead and is that is that Sarah? Yeah, I I mean I was just can we run through just one example just to answer okay. one problem? All right, so um, let's let me pull up a. It seems pretty straightforward um, okay. for the most part. Uh, New Blake document. Okay. All right. Are you seeing this? Uh huh. Okay, so let's say, and I'm just going to make something up, a uh, 100 foot run of PVC on a rooftop um, with a 90 degree Fahrenheit let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Can you read this? <laughs> Maybe that. Yeah. yeah. There we go. 90 degree. 90 degree Fahrenheit uh, temperature variation. Um, assume the conduit is in sunlight and uh, uh, will be 30 degrees Fahrenheit higher than ambient. Uh, and I'm going to say ambient up here just to be specific, right? <laughs> Otherwise, people might think that temperature variation might already be accounting for the ambient. Hopefully, the question uh, will be this clear. Um, 
a 100 foot rod of PVC on a rooftop with 30 with 90 degree Fahrenheit temperature variation ambient. Assume the conduit is in sunlight and will be 30 degrees Fahrenheit 30, 30 degrees Fahrenheit higher than ambient. Um, how many expansion fittings would be required if each fitting allowed for four inches of travel. Okay? Um, all right, so, so going back to, let's use the NEC for this. And let me jump back through all these many pages back to the uh, CBC. Okay, that was it right there. All right. So, okay, so we're used, going from the Fahrenheit column. Okay. Um, get this out of the way. Bring this up. All right. Temperature change in Fahrenheit. So, so we indicated that there was a 90 degree ambient difference, but we also indicated that it was in sunlight. And the question provided a provision for adding 30 degrees uh, 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 due to being in sunlight to the ambient. So it's really a 120 degree change. Okay. Uh, so the answer then would come from temperature change Fahrenheit, 120, which is 90 plus 30, which means that we should expect 4.87 inches of, 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 of uh, length change uh, due to temperature, okay? So <clears throat> that would mean... So, 120 degree Fahrenheit uh, temperature change uh, means there will be 4.87 4.87 inches of uh, length change, which means that uh, uh, if if each, if each expansion fitting allows for four inches of, of travel, uh, if each expansion fitting allows for four inches of travel, you would need two expansion fittings. Okay, so, so that's uh, that might be a question, and uh, I don't know how they would ask this question, but uh, let's say, uh, assume question one, expansion fitting installation occurred during... Uh, an ambient temperature of, you know, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, how far in should the barrel be, or uh, how far in should the, uh, see how this is verbalized here. All right. Okay. So that's three, four, uh, of the way in. Okay, here we go. How far should the piston be in the barrel <laughs> for proper insulation? Okay, now presumably there will be some kind of, if, if they have a question about this, they're not going to expect you to memorize whatever the manufacturing instructions might have been you know, uh, uh, in in the 
from, from Carlon or, or whoever, they would likely have some other table somewhere that listed, you know, uh, that, that provided the, the information. I can't imagine that they would expect you to memorize something like that. But I could see them bringing up something like this in the text, you know. Um, I, I imagine they're very sensitive to expansion fittings now um, that this fire has occurred. So, um, but at any rate, the answer uh, is three quarter, three quarter, yeah, three quarter of the way in the barrel. Three quarter the way <laughs> in the barrel. Can't think of a better way. That's how they used to describe it, so that must be the way to say it. That piston three quarter of the way in the barrel. There we go. I'll add that. That piston three quarter of the way in the barrel. Anyway, um, I think if you read that document, and watch this video and go to the uh, um, that part of the code. You shouldn't have any problem in answering a question like this. But had you not been alerted to these these facts, you, you, you may not have had any idea where to go to get this answer. So that's why I thought that this, uh, Thank this little you, video Richard. might have some. You're welcome. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and end. Uh, well, I'll just stop recording. Uh, record. Stop.